All right, our first reader today is Jonathan Youngkins, and he's a Los Angeles-based writer and photographer who earned an MFA from Cal State Long Beach while also working as an in-home healthcare provider, an occupation he continues to this day. His work has appeared in Loud Coffee Press, Panoply, I don't know how, Synchronicity, West Texas Poetry Review and other publications. His second poetry chapbook, Beneath a Glazed Shimmer, won the 2019 Clockwise Chapbook Competition and was published um, in 2021 by Tebbit Bach. Take it away, John. Uh, take it away and take it where? We all <laughs> surprise us. Surprise us. Alrighty, I'm going to surprise myself too. I'll pull it up from the book, and we'll see what happens from there. How do I spotlight? That's a good question. I got my timer. You said about ten minutes, right? If I remember right, Robbie. What's that? About ten minutes, thereabouts. Yes, Three. ten minutes. Yes. Okay. Alrighty. Well, let me pull a couple from the book here. And this is the book, Beneath the Glazed Shimmer. Uh, I put the link to uh, buying copies on online in case anybody is interested. So that's my shameless plug for the day. But uh, this one, this poem's called, This Page Only is the End of Nothing. The only thing missing on this horse trail, concrete paved to model T's, is a horse's hot breath, its steaming damp coat. My neighbor, in his wheelchair, snatches fall leaves off grass, starts to crush them as though to feel time wriggle between his fingers. His face, a squashed beer can, crinkles. The street, too narrow for more than one vehicle, shows gray age spots, patches which quilt through its sand tone. Winter rain widens gaps between stone and Portland cement. Wheelchair tracks interrupt mud with their interjected frailty. Chair wheels loop back to themselves like clock dials, obdurate heartbeats weighed in steel, weighed in steel shoes. The equine loop misses just the hissing post, reins looped in silence through its rain. Patience is nothing to write home about. I throw out plastic garbage bags full of linoleum and mounting depression. My invisible dreams still stalk me as I walk downtown LA at midnight. My foresight won't out out damn spot, no matter how I scrub the glass. Why stay in California when its stole season hangs out with Jose Cuervo? It sleeps off the booze in a shaded room while a refrigerator hums Brahms. Parade floats break through the fourth wall at Walmart to the joy of shoppers. Right after this, the news preempts the looming apocalypse for a car chase. Alrighty. One of the things that, that comes up once in a while being a provider um, I used to take care of a couple of people out towards Monrovia and um, Duarte. I used to run a support group out that way too. And once in a while, you see how someone progresses or you see how they are and you go, wow, you've come a long way. This is really fantastic. And, and the woman in here is, you know, indicative of that. She was a good friend and I, I was a care provider for her for a couple of years. So the title of this is, and she is happy if free. Therese was a piano string, copper wire wrapped around steel wire, loosened turn by turn from her tuning peg until she slipped supple from her hitch pin on a rigid steel frame where, at speaking length, her nerves have reverberated, sustained pedal held down without end until electroshock released that foot weight, let sustained notes fade, air slacken, Go motionless as late afternoon we surveyed, green and unwavering, 
the neighborhood lawns both smooth and nautical, where water and air merged. As we observed the undisturbed street and were in turn left undisturbed while we sat on her mother's porch, watched the grass grow as Teresa's gaze drifted until it spied me facing her and she asked what I was smiling at. And I couldn't say for anything approaching truth, whether she or Tide was the cause for it. Alrighty, this is probably the shortest poem in the book. While I was going to Cal State Long Beach, every afternoon I was there, there was a professor who would go ahead and, and walk his dog out there. And, and just the way the dog was, uh, being a St. Bernard, I mean, you get all these ideas about the about the rescue dogs and the, and the, and everything up the Alps and everything. It just seemed like a, even more of an irony. Um, the poems are what they call an American sentence, which means it's 17 syllables, one line, get in, get out, be quirky if you can. But uh, the title is, the dress code is casual, the atmosphere relaxed. He drags his St. Bernard like the dog really wants to save anyone. And just in case we have any Bogart fans in here, um, see how many movies you can go ahead and pick up from this, from this one. The title is, Say This is a Street, Therefore People Walk Down It. Raccoons hunt trash cans for Snow White's apple. It's like brewing trouble or coffee through a nylon stocking. Don't think about the glass zipper. It'll be fine. This isn't chopped fairy tales, just keeping my metaphors in something approaching a row, since ducks are nowhere in sight, scattered by shotgun interruptions of a genetically unsound mind, fired in random directions as my thought that thoughts dance tracks northbound toward Union Station. Some days, this feels like the place where myths come to die, discarded like cigarette butts flicked to somersault and chill, ossify in a Philip Marlowe reflection, pass words into chess pieces, close up and personal on Rick's board in Casablanca, while I blur goat bogarts, amalgamate loners in a lonely place, the low road alongside my house. Anger flash cartwheels as it did with Dixon Steele, another Bogart. Its fists work me. Cigarette burns, coffin nails in bogey's parlance, line the street, a row to hammer down the casket lid. Coffee's black, the morning rancid. The raccoons left a peanut butter jar beneath a bush. I could spread what's inside for my most important trauma of the day. My words play tricks on me with fractured slogans. Most important trauma of the day, attention derailment disorder, refuse from, thrown from brain to street. My wit's the glue that keeps this plywood laminated, tacked onto joists into a floor through which I hope not to plummet, while the LA skyline devours an orange supermoon as it descends, as if we still grew oranges in earnest. The apple of my eye booked in a fairy tale on Amazon. Raccoons find Snow White's fruit. Each takes a bite, then drug staggers to sleep it off under a pickup truck. What amazes me is that the, most of this I wrote in 2018, 2019, some of it at Long Beach and some of it at, just after I graduated. And here we are at 2021, going back to what this poem articulates. And it's like, why? My goodness, we had sh shootings back then, we have them again. And I'm just, I'm just shaking my head like nobody's business. Attention shoppers, from within this inverted painted, painted steel, from within the inverted painted steel Walmart shelves, Laundry detergent and ammunition is stockpiled in capitalist seclusion across from the liquor store. We all know breakfast cereal doesn't come with an assault rifle inside. The last named, like the late maimed, 
His special order in the store won't allow crossfire with potential victims for sake of breakage. But there are first aid kits and duct tape to deal with the situation, even if those items are several aisles distant in respective locations. Even without store help, there's an excellent fuel division for a wet sheen, not unlike nail polish, sharp crayons for self-defense, boxed in assorted shades of mayhem, and a rampant ideology that everything green is good, insanity nowhere near mental illness, in loud reports of truth, justice, and Superman's dead, get Batman. The sequel to the book, is it's a COVID book. And um, I'm glad there's a tunnel on that one. But um, at the same time, there are, there are nights where it, it seems like quiet is haunting. Like a night sound for which there's no explanation. I keep defining silence by what insists is missing. College kids smoking cigarettes and marijuana out front of my place, across from their smoke-free campus. An iPhone blaring a soundtrack. Laughter. Conversations like hot air balloons hovering overhead until heat they capture fades and gravity kicks in. There's a hush now. Sound in itself has a heartbeat blending seamless with the dark as it drapes a brick retaining wall. It sucks in drag, it sucks in a drag of cool air next to purple lantana. Blossoms detached as stars and exhales lawn and slow as dust settling. It's the soundlessness of freezer frost in Ziploc bags, a ground shuck, meat rock hard with isolation, marbled with chill. The moon's an orange twist laid against a high rise that passes as highball glass. Sky clinks against glass, settling as it waters down my composure. Angostino bites my tongue. Condensation trickles down an unbreathed sigh. John? Yes, it's about that time. Yep, yep. No worries, thanks very much. And uh, thank you so much for your time. So, Thank you. Thank you. All righty then. Our next reader is Jane Rosenberg LaForge coming all the way from her living room <laughs> in New York City. Jane writes poetry, fiction, and occasional essays from her home. She's the author of seven volumes of poetry, count them, a memoir, and two novels. Her novel, The Hawkman, A Fairy Tale of the Great War, was a finalist in two categories for the 2019 Eric Hoffer Awards. Her poetry and fiction have been nominated for Story South Million Writers Award, the Pushcart Prize, and the Best of the Net compilation. Her new novel is Sisterhood of the Infamous from New Meridian Arts Press, and her new book of poems is Medusa's Daughter, from Animal Heart Press. Take it away, Jane. Thanks. Hey. Um, I have a poem here for Robbie Nestor that I've been working on on and off for about a year. So I'm gonna start with that. And it doesn't have a title. If you have a suggestion, I'm open to it. The sun is a sack that feeds the chick, dispatching the argument over whether ability precedes need or makes quick work of sequences. Fish to birds, or birds to fish. You come to know your humanity, supposedly, by whether you look from the top down, or if you can glimpse the bubbles at the bottom that lifts gills and tails to air, or the evolution of wings into fins, ballast for a different sense of flight, too often belittled as a sentence. In the signals we take as word from a nascent civilization, we hear not hope, but thinning spackle and daub that holds the cosmos together as if to seal off the dead from listening. When my father lost his hearing, he saw spikes rather than stars. 
He saw what hammered the railroad to the earth as he experimented with explosives, the railroad's warning system for oncoming cars. You say you're losing one of your best senses as though you will be trapped in a shell beneath obstacle without ambiance. What carries the messages, <coughs> excuse me, what carries the messages from breast to wet, wet feathers. But trust me, true loss is far more gradual, like weaning a child so he might stand on his own without your hand to steady him through the orbit and tunnel, and tumble. Okay, now that we've done that, um, I'm going to um, read something from my uh, second to last uh, collection. It's called Daphne and Her Discontents, and that'll explain why the next collection is called Medusa's Daughter. So here's the last poem in Daphne and Her Discontents, and it's called Post Daphne. The problem is I did not fit the myth over and over again, like a kind of slacker Sisyphus, objectives put off, delayed from purchase, slut that I was, lazy and living only to be captured, lassoed like a prized calf and linked to my captor by silver handcuffs, rope being too diffident. I wanted to be drawn down at the ankle, dressed up, dress off, crinkled and stashed under the bed or above the rafters where the conversation settled like cobwebs. Look up for once more around the sun, look down for the back to front, hair in my mouth, the grip of my toes on simulated wood paneling. I wanted to be that nymph, plastic and spiritual, swaying above the dashboard beneath the rear view mirror in the headspace of the gods and criminals and roadside distractions that flip drivers and car bodies and make cowards of the bystanders. Post means neither after nor subsequent, but wood, stake or steel, supporting all the potential developments. Let me hold you, you the wily and interchangeable. Let me embrace you, you dictator of the benevolent. Okay, so this is the book, uh, Medusa's Daughter. Uh, I put a link to buy it and it would be very nice if you bought it. And I have a novel and you can buy that too. And I put the link up for that too. So this is a, a book, uh, pretty much about my mother. And this poem is gonna be called Medusa's Resources. Instead of luxurious shafts of screens and radio advertisements, she is given a wiry batch, stinging at the eyes as if diamond backed, black and rusted and in an age when she will know children an inevitable absence, like an assault beyond the scalp into the smooth muscle inside the cranium. Not exactly snake-like, but conscious patterns copied from the anonymous, discovered quickly, repeated, when no one is watching and when discovered again, they are abandoned. They're how she keeps straight notions of the past in a non-language. From German to its Hebrew and Swiss variants to describe non-incidents embedded in the form, although everyone has their own model, regardless of whether they can admit it. So when she asks which feminine hygiene products are in stock, she has brought a diaper, accepts it in a rage of embarrassment. When she solves the puzzle of war, liberation and economics, tearing family and community apart, she expects an award of more time, but is undecided between Greenwich Mean and Pacific Standard. Time pours, spills, inundates. She suspects she's been robbed. She'll invest the rest of her life searching for orphaned minutes. After a full circle pre and post Meridian, the identity of seconds remains ambiguous. They are lodged somewhere between embers and splatters, the ash from hard black anthracite, the seat of madness and origins, the venoms she was born with. This is called Medusa's Crime and Punishment. Birth and death too powerful for a woman to practice. I am no longer practicing medicine, she always said. After the cancers and diabetes, one a birth of sorts, the other the obliteration of an organ. To balance all this, not in one mind, but with everything else, the brain that is physical, the metaphysics, the scalp that shields and repels, that suffers from exposure in its task of camouflage, 
perhaps if there was one more, there was more than one woman in charge, a bevy of personalities for a cacophony of demands, blue manias, mean reds, though that's not the way the authors wrote it. I wish I could be like Henry Kissinger, she said, and always know the magic word, the revelatory comment. Or I could be like a god, the one who planned this, though there is only one god but God and not in her religion. In hers, there are none. That's why she must be punished, taken from her family, not for what she failed to stop before the idols from seeing in the temple, and not because she is a victim, but because she is a believer in her convictions, in her own clear way of thinking. This is called Snakes in Your Hair. Surveillance is the punishment, as the lidless creatures never sleep like the Pinkertons, once an intellectual curiosity. I'm trying to get back to the original horror, the first interpretation, the chameleon, the command, sin before temptation was explained, if not to man, then to women. There is no life in an umbil umb umbilical cord, per se. It's simply a conduit, like a messenger objective about the discontent it delivers each morning. Each morning is harder than the last, but don't stop the rending of garments, the scissors and seam rippers. They are what enable us to shed last year's fashions, make them new again. I don't like change. I like comfort. I like an old beaten varnish rather than the rich chestnut. I don't remember their death, but I remember the elm disease, an East Coast thing, the spackled trunks, the open branches like lips, waiting for air or miracles to save them. Okay, this is called Medusa the Mason. For my wedding, my mother got down on her hands and knees, a posture she thought threatening when demanding we clean our rooms because it spoke of her raw desperation and special pleading her housewifery had to resort to. But for my wedding, she filled in a patio full of cracks and obstacles in just that pose, as if a journeyman mason with pointers and trowels and putty of her own formulation, so people could dance like demons without tripping and falling or activating her homeowner's insurance. This was the work at which she excelled, the minutia, the meticulous, the dollhouse dimensions, cooking and cleaning, the care and grooming of her daughters, their hair in knots, their white socks pink, stained pink, from mixing in the red with the hot water wash. Also her husband's undershirts that her daughters appropriated for iron-ons and logos. The dishes brooding in the sink for days. The steak tasteless, despite the application of spices and marinades. One wonders what might have blossomed if she was given protractors and slide rolls, erector sets and a drafting table, the time to dream of bridges and monuments, airports and office buildings, an enterprise to run like the one she ran for our father when he wasn't looking, when he wasn't making a profit because he couldn't do both simultaneously, money and administration. One wonders what I might do for my own daughter when her time comes and she needs something more than what my words can create and my credit card can purchase. Am I okay for time? I can't hear you because you're, you're, uh, you're, which one call it? You're, you're muted. Yeah, no, you're done. Okay, I'm done. That's fine. I'm going to stick a fork in you. Sorry. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Read the comments. There's lots of comments. Okay, great. All right. Our last feature this morning is Diana Henning. Diana has appeared in many journals and she's been nominated four times for a push cart and taught through California poetry in the schools. She's received several CAC grants. I don't know what those are. California oh, Arts Council. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, I was thinking something else like caca, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, taught poetry workshops through the William James Association Prison Arts Program. Henning's most recent collection was Cathedral of the Hand, from Finishing Line Press in 2016. You can find her on the web, but I'll, I'll put her this address in the chat 
once she starts reading. So go ahead, Diana, nice to have you. Oh, thank you, nice to be here. I'm enjoying the other people's readings. Um, I don't normally do um, uh, form poems like Philonelles and Sonnets, but I did do a couple. It was like energy was released after Trump was dumped. Um, I couldn't write that much when he was in office. So anyway, the first one is a villanelle of sorts, the Commonwealth of Joy. My former husband sends me Kate Wolf's music, something we love to which he now returns, freed from marriage to another, free to pick moments, to casually flick through group picks of family albums, toss those he spurns. My former sends me Kate Wolf's music. I shake my head, wondering why he picked this moment in our decrepitude. What concern prompted this, I ask straight out. Why pick now? Had he recalled Frog Hollow's folk festival and how he keenly yearned <coughs> mastery of the banjo? Back then he was music and I his newly acquired sidekick who watched the pleasure in his face, its burn, as his fingers raced from gradual to quick. Oh, but we were joyful over Kate Wolf's music. Hand in hand, we danced, we twirled, we turned with others in our commonwealth of joy. It's thick tonic of goodwill, blessings beyond therapeutic. The next Villanelle is a little dark, uh, kind of, I was thinking of Dylan Thomas, maybe. Uh, do not go gentle into that, good night. In passing, dread the death that comes after months of pain, relatives and friends shuttling meals, tidying the house, letters from friends, cards and flowers, a weather vane predicting coastal storms that promise thunderous rain, and always a jokester amongst the saddened family and spouse, dread the death that arrives after months of pain, hush, Speak not ill of the ill, mention not her name, pretend, pretend, and speak light things, not weather's douse, nor of letters from friends, cards and flowers, a busted weather vane. Here on the coast of Maine, the ocean's dangerous gain, flashes foreboding whitecaps, power poles awry, pronounced texts from friends, cards and flowers, the downed weather vane, predicting what, just what, oh damn near death, it's gain, and hands that wring their rot, their clenched announcement, oh the tremor, the twang on the metal weather vane. I shan't be the one to note, to note last breath, Death Spain, nor how the heart renounced its tidy house. Dread the death that comes after months of pain. Curse, curse the winds that carried off the busted weather vane. The next one is a sonnet and it happened a while back. I lost my keys and I searched for three days trying to find them. I even looked in the refrigerator. I thought, am I getting a little Alzheimer's or something? And I lost keys. I fret, panic to find my keys, dig in dirt planters, hoping they're there, walk the grounds, rake through our burn pile. Have I lost it? I asked, worried memory escaped that stone temple called head. Even the fridge, its beehive compartments, various cheeses nested in their drawer, return no results. I check the garage, its dark mirage, watch for black widows, mice on speed. Tentatively, I creep fingers along shelving, not there. Something breaks inside me. I've become a clock with missing hands. Nothing leads to a silvered ring with keys that chime. All that I cannot open takes precedence. The mailbox, getaway car, even my residence. Um, the next one I'm going to read is from The Tenderness House 
the first book that I got published through Poets Corner Press in Stockton. And my husband helped me to revise it because I overwrite. And so it's online. You can purchase it, I believe, at, um, at oh gosh, what is it called? Amazon. This is a very old poem. Pushing God through to the visible. On a sheet of wax paper, your grandmother rolled the lightly salted trout in flour before settling the fish into the freshly seasoned skillet. You ran your hand along flour's silky edge to make imaginary fish scoot across the kitchen counter. Afterwards, you sucked your fingers for, uh, for hints of the lake where the trout once swam. In your grandmother's kitchen, water enveloped you, minnows shooting about, and the stones always more beautiful in their submerged world. When your grandmother lowered fish into the fat, the trout's eyes sizzled white. After several cooked, she slid them onto a brown grocery bag, drained off the lard. How quickly the trout's bedazzled eyes clouded strange seeds for the infinite. You balled your fists, shoved them into your eye sockets to keep your eyes from spilling into the hot fat. In a world of small contingencies, everything, including yourself, was perishable. Um, then to show a little variety, this is just kind of a funny poem. I came from the village of painted toes. You came from the village of shaving cream. Your mouth hugged my mouth as though it were a plum. Stars outside our tent wrangled for better seats. Intruders, you yelled, zipping the flap. Our sleeping bag inched into a cocoon. The moon, as it pressed through nylon, spread silver on our lips. When you whispered my salty name, my heart fished for trout. We could have made our home anywhere, a good ground cover, an oil skillet, but you were the man from Shaving Cream Village, and I, the woman with a penchant for fancy toes. We dipped into the water and let our fish go. That's from the Tenderness House. I'm putting a plug in for it. And then from Cathedral of the Hand. Two minute warning. What? Two minute warning. Two minute warning? Yeah. Okay, The Butcher's Apprentice was nominated for a push card um, and it was in Hawaii Pacific Review. First, he showed how to hold the cleaver, where to make the best cut, and how beautifully the meat opened, gracious host to its own body. The apprentice wiped his hands across his white apron, his sigh, such finesse, a sigh a lover might make at climax, but no climax here, only the calm of knowing one did the other body right. And you can tell that the one being trained sought the best advice, especially since fine, fine butchery is nearly extinct. For why else would the master train the hand coming back to fingers to open carefully at first the red inner flesh that was once desire? Do I have time for one more? No? Okay. No. Thank you, okay. Bill. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. I just love them, especially the food poems. So I'm delighted that you, you read those. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Our next order of business is the open mic. And I'm not sure everyone is here today. In fact, I don't see some folks, but it's possible that you're on the second page. So that's why I don't see you. So our first reader is Kika Dorsey. You've got two poems or what is it? Five minutes, whichever comes first. I got five minutes. I think that's two poems, two shorter ones. Okay, this first one is a recent poem that um, I just wrote, wrote last week. It's called As If. 
it wasn't as if we motored our way through when we needed to sleep or our muscles constellated into barn sour horses, or we didn't kneel with the weight of heaven on our backs or time seep through our cracks to make us younger. It wasn't as if a ghost ship sailed white flags of surrender or crocus blossoms learned camouflage or April lost its keys from torn pockets of clouds or we forgot how the fire bypassed our roof. We all do our best, toss lapis lazuli runes to the wind, finger our bloodlines and efforts with swirling prints, a sun playing Haydn sonatas on the piano, a dream of climbing sand dunes with fathers, two sisters collecting cicada shells, a daughter riding Pacific waves, a cemetery in Memphis, ashes in the Danube, hounds unleashed to track our fate, a little girl falling, and our hubris collapsed and transformed, dense as seeds we plant in a memory we refuse to embellish, as if we could unveil our eyes, uncloak, unmask how our vision spills like a rising tide and a shore that lets it be. And then this next is from my book, Occupied. Vienna is a broken man and daughter of hunger and it's called The Sunflowers. It is, it is always morning and black before the sun rises, a braided rippled river of sleep untangling in coffee. And I am covered with a blanket made from the wool of sheep I lost count of and memories I saved in a hickory box my father gave to me from the mental hospital. He shellacked it with a scene from a magazine of a horse grazing with a red barn in the background. It was like the barn he would take me to on his Harley where I rode my wild horse that bucked off everyone but me, my horse Sandy with her roan coat and half Arab foal. And now it is morning and I've lost the box where I stored my pearls and red rabbit foot keychain for luck I managed to have enough in life and I never used the amulet for keys because we never locked our doors. Now all I have of my father is a painting by my mother of his freckled face surrounded by sunflowers. And as I sip coffee, I think of the day I walked up the hill in Italy on the way to Assisi, surrounded by sunflower fields, the sun in their faces as golden as the cross I bought, and the walls of the city thick on my tongue when I tried to nail down all the things I never could say to him. When I walked down the hill to the train, the sun was closer to the wet west and all the blooms turned away from me. They may have been smiling or they may have wept their seeds for birds or maybe those flowers know nothing of themselves and just fold like <coughs> origami in the gentle and tame hands of night. Thank you, Kika. I finally got unmuted. You can put, you can put your yeah. books into the um, into the chat if you. Oh, like. okay. I will. It's good to see you on the open mic. Um, our next person is. I'm not sure she's here. Are you here, Rosemary? Rosemary Bohm? I haven't seen her on here, Robbie. Okay, she's not here then. I've signed on a couple of people for for the mic. Uh, Sterling Warner is here. I know he's here, so he can pick up the open mic right now. Okay, well, for my two poems, this is uh, semi-recent. Uh, had a bit of a storm back in February, and that inspired this. It's called Utopian Chillin' or Snowbound with Benefits. Quiet, content to exist in moments miraculous the firmament folded into a chirogenic shroud. Skies spread across an arctic grotto's chiseled roof, enclosed on all sides with iceberg walls that jut out of earth and water, form four sides north, south, east and west, piercing air, pursing remnants of a fiery welkin like polar columns, frigidly textured, 
linked to permafrost ceilings, hanging damp canopies that dripped and congeal like popsicle stalactites from wet and dry caves. Sunlight peeps through the cavern's glacial mouth, touches life frozen in Antarctica's drifting time warp. A valley veiled in falling snow hosts western red cedar clusters dotting hilltops, roots into the wintry lake shallows where intrepid explorers venture forth, cautious of beauty, mystified by the sub-zero dreamscape promising repose, searching, searching, searching ineffable and ineffable enlightenment. They paddle towards an island where siren voices beckon. Empathy crystallizes tears. Appetites become currency and sacrifices exchange pain's plurality to pleasure. The tranquil walk-in freezer She's a timeless cuspidor, stimulating numb bodies, re-energizing taciturn thoughts. And for my second poem, uh, this was recently published in um, The Eye uh, by the uh, Pangolin uh, Review, and it's called She Fox. She fo uh, silver she fox still dazzles airway aisles. Passions, blue veins, marble alabaster hands that delicately invite all observers to slide into seats, buckle belts, observe a safety pantomime. Some imagine her fragrant, lilac scented breath, frosting masks that drop indiscriminately, yet with purpose, from secret chambers overhead and hang like pristine plastic doilies awaiting eager mouths and oxygen-starved lungs. The beverage cart mistress supplies thirsty sky sailors with high-altitude water, fluid that refreshes minds as passengers become liquid lotus eaters. And she morphs into sirens, invites young and old on adventures, seductively settles everyone for an event-filled flight. Yet the silver fox flashes a young woman's smile through grandmotherly lips. A myth-making matron, still green, quite alive, despite her wintry nights, drawn out days and spotted autumn years. The silver fox's touches cheer more than fear of flying, beguiling men like Circe, engaging women with sapphiric charm. This skyway attendant of many colors exudes exotic senior sexuality, hidden behind a maternal kiss while passengers envision her lifelong journey a mythical quest a seductress's, seductress's saga, undaunted as time's cold fingers stroke near perfect cheeks, where silk soft wrinkles fold like prayers, and grace etches upon inevitable design. They chronicle chimerical immortality without apology, shaking indifferent snow globe wishes for eternal youth at 4,000 feet. Thank you. Thank you. Our next person on the open mic is Marianne Hurt. There, I think I've got it. Am I good? Can you hear me okay? I can. Okay, good. All righty. Um, I lived in New Mexico a few Januaries ago, and I helped cook at a Pueblo feast day, and this is the poem that came out of that. Sunflower, yellow gem corn, hoop dancing. I chop celery, cabbage, potatoes. Feel the heat of Orno's first fire. Watch the miracle of dough becoming bread. No in my bones, not in my ears, the blessing of the new Orno, that domed adobe's oven. Listen now how the drums, the hoop dancers draw circles in my waiting heart. And the pale old grandpa of gone too young Tino Hoop dancer extraordinaire gives me corn, sunflower yellow gem corn, 
slips the kernels into an oily old popcorn bag, instructs me, take them back to Wisconsin, plant them in the light, where his grandson will grow, taste the sun, dance again. Thank you.